Thank you. I'd like to have you remember the last time you saw something that made you say the word, wow. Close your eyes. Do you remember how you felt? Were you surprised? Were you exhilarated? It was probably something unobvious, unexpected. When you say the word, wow, it's something that you don't plan to say. It's just an, it's a reaction. Wow, wow, oh my gosh. You know, we're put on this earth to serve others. I want to call those our customers. If you're a teacher, your customers are your students. If you're a parent, your customers are your children. We all want to wow them, don't we? But if you do the obvious expected thing, you're not going to wow them. You wow them with ambiguity. And this is where chaos and uncertainty and ambiguity come in. If you can figure out how to embrace that, you can get to the wow factor. Our reaction to ambiguity is to avoid it. If you avoid it, it might crush you. If you survive it, you only end up where you started. But if you embrace it, you can create the wow. You know, there is a Chinese symbol for the word crisis. It's made up of two other symbols. One is danger, and the other is opportunity. Focus on the opportunity. You know, you can brace it to create that wow factor. Wow is the opposite of obvious. Wow is emotional. Obvious is expected. Wow is surprising, obvious is that expected, expected idea. You know, wow is emotional. It just comes from the inside. Obvious is calm. But wait a minute. Aren't we expected to take the obvious expected power, uh, path forward? I know I was. I grew up in a little town called Sharon, Pennsylvania, little steel town north of Pittsburgh. My obvious path was to go to design school and get a job at a big corporation like General Motors. So off I went to the Cleveland Institute of Arts Industrial Design Program. The first day there, I met John Spurk, another kid from a Pennsylvania steel town. Identical backgrounds. We worked hard. We went through five years of design school and we graduated, and we both got phenomenal job offers. I got one at General Motors. He got one for Huffy Bicycle. Our parents were proud, our professors were proud, life was good, and then we did the unexpected, unobvious thing. We found a garage, started a design innovation company with no money, no connections, no nothing. Why did we do that? We thought that the world might reward the unobvious way. So we started designing, inventing, and doing things. But you know, it was hard at first. But we started to discover something. We started to get inventions and designs and things. How do you get a patent? We didn't know how to get a patent. Let's find out. Did you know that there's only one way to get a patent? Only one. It has to be obvious. That's it. That's it. If you have a great idea, and it's a great improvement, and it's wonderful, but it's obvious, you don't get a patent. You have to be the first one to think of something put together in a different way. Then you get a patent. It has to be a wow. It has to be unexpected, unobvious. Now, how do you get there? 
you start with an unexpected, inspiring environment. Because we looked at the patent office, we looked at patents uh, granted by the U.S. government. The first patent was, was granted by George Washington. All the way to present day, we just passed the 10 million patent number. Sounds like a big number, doesn't it? But did you know that only 5% of U.S. patents have ever been commercialized? That means of that 10 million, only half a million have created economic value. That's an awful number. It's, think of all that went into those 10 million patents, but only half a million are creating economic value. We thought that maybe there's a way to turn 5% into 95%. Let's look at the great innovators of the past. Thomas Edison had his Menlo Park group, not too far from here in New Jersey, Menlo Park. He put a pipe organ in his, in his workshop to inspire his, his workers. Steve Jobs, when he was putting together Pixar, put a central atrium, stacked floors, put people together, all together to do Pixar. So we looked for an environment where we could do the same thing. We heard of this monumental building about the size of the White House, bigger than the White House. It had a tower a little bit bigger than the statue part of the Statue of Liberty. We stood back and said, can we figure out how to acquire this thing? And we did. Now, here's the secret sauce. You always start with a customer. We partner with a client partner who's in a certain market area. We want to know what that customer is feeling. And you end up with delivery. You start with a focus group. They're not going to tell you what, what, what the wow factor is going to be. You have to find that out. So you have to look at the pain points. You have to look at the twinkle in their eye. I want my designers, my engineers, my prototypers to look through that two-way mirror in our facility and see what the customer's thinking. You'll want to watch the body language. You want to look at those pain points. Then you have rich data. Then you go to another session several days later. And we have something called the divergent session. And this, we get in a room, we have our teams, there's no rules, there's no bad ideas, it's all positive, you all build, but you go from mild to wild. Mild is those expected incremental improvements, you gotta put that on the wall, you gotta get out of your system. Then the wild is, what's the wildest thing you can think of? Forget if you, if you can, can't make it, forget it's gonna cost too much, forget if the technology, just put it up there, and everything in between. At the end, we're exhausted emotionally and physically. Then you have another session called the convergent session. Now this session, everybody gets three note cards. We have about 10 people in the room. You have a note card that says, who cares? One that says, nice. And one that says, wow. Everybody has three note cards. We take turns presenting our idea and hold up your note cards all at the same time. We don't want to influence anybody. If everybody says, who cares? Forget it. Throw it off the table. It's not going to work. If most people say nice, that's my hardest card. There's too many nice products in the world. But that's not emotional. Yeah, it's nice. It's okay. But if you say, wow, wow, now you've got something. Now, that's only the first part. Can it work? You run down to the prototype shop. You immediately say, let's see if we can prove feasibility. Let's see if we can get it to work. And we built what's called a Frankenstein prototype. We call it a, a works-like prototype. Doesn't look like much, but it proves that it can work. And then you go into design and engineering. You keep refining that prototype over and over again. And then you build a looks-like prototype. And then the ultimate is a looks-like, works-like prototype. This looks exactly like the real thing, the real thing that you might see in your home. Each time you go back to that customer. So 
right before you go into production, you want to see if you've got the right thing. You want to see if you priced it right. You want to see if it's great. You want to see if you have the wow factor. So I remember going into the two-way mirror, looking at that customer. Looks like, works like, wonderful prototype. We had a customer in the room that said, I want to buy that product. The moderator said, well, it's not for sale. It's a prototype. No, no, you don't understand. I want to buy it. I don't care what the price is. Well, it's, it's a prototype. It does, it's not real. And then she did something I'll never forget. She embraced the prototype and said, I'm not leaving until I can take this with me. I knew I had a while. If you can figure out how to embrace the ambiguity in your lives, you will wow your customers. Thank you.